As Naomi said, uh, my name's Tom. Uh, I'm a human rights researcher, law student, and uh, I also work for CIS. Uh, so I'm here today to talk about what lies behind the curtain of the global porn industry. Often when people talk about the porn industry, the word industry is used, but absent-mindedly, uh, if not by the people in this room, then certainly by the man on the street. But it is an industry. It's now a multi-billion dollar global industry with revenue anywhere from $2 billion to upwards of $90 billion per year. It functions as any other industry does with employees, producers, marketing, publicity, and enormous amounts of money exchanged between parties. For example, in 2016, in 2016, Pornhub had 23 billion visits. This is roughly 64 million people per day viewing just one mainstream site. And in 2014, 5,246 centuries worth of footage was viewed on one site alone. But today, I'm going to focus on the company that is arguably at the centre of this entire industry, MindGeek. For those of you who may not know, MindGeek is a porn provider, or more accurately, the porn provider. They're a global conglomerate owning around 80% of the entire global industry, which operates many popular pornographic websites as an umbrella corporation, including the tube style sites Pornhub, RedTube, and YouPorn, as well as adult film production companies Brazzers, Digital Playground, Men.com, and more. Now technically, and I use the word technically loosely there, they're a technology and IT company. But a look behind the curtain shows that they are ruthless and hell-bent on profit at all cost. Now as I just mentioned, uh, they own a number of the tube style sites which function in a similar way to YouTube for those that aren't familiar with it. Uh, in effect, it acts as a free-for-all in terms of availability of content and accessibility. You can log on find anything from the paedophile fantasy of angry dad punishes teen babysitter to the racist black whore abused by white guy. Now, I'm certainly not calling into question the abhorrent abuse, misogyny and racism within the industry. Of course, that's plain to see with a simple search. But the exploitation runs deeper than on a multitude of levels. Apart from profiting off the commercialised abuse of women, one of the major issues that MindGeek has created for those actually within the industry is that a large number of the aforementioned tube sites host pirated or stolen content. So any profit left after they take their cut doesn't go towards the people that have created the content. So not only are the performers sexually exploited, it then leaves them vulnerable to further economic exploitation in terms of both lower payment due to piracy but also there are no residual earnings as MindGeek end up taking any hosting profit. This creates a vicious cycle where the women who have had to appear in porn for financial reasons in the first place are then further trapped because they haven't made the money they needed. Then, unscrupulous and predatory producers subsequently capitalise on this in an effort to make their own profit off the back of underpaying performers and reducing overheads. MindGeek has become the porn monopoly, putting industry members in the paradoxical position of working for the very company which profits from the piracy of their work. While each individual tube site allegedly responds to DMCA copyright takedown requests, most porn producers don't have the resources of movie studios or record labels to monitor piracy. According to adult film star Siri, MindGeek sites force copyright holders to jump through hoops to get the content removed. Going back to 2014, the production of the quote-unquote professional porn films was down 75% from where it was eight years before, and DVD sales down 50% in that time. But this shouldn't be seen as a positive reduction in the size of the porn industry per se, or a stemming of the proliferation of abuse and misogyny. The general sentiment is that the porn business crash around 2008 was due to the rise of wide-scale piracy on tube sites and torrents, an increase in amateur pornography, and the global recession. The decline has continued since then, driving down fees and causing performers to look elsewhere to make ends meet. 
As one industry insider stated, when I started, I could count the performers I know who did prostitution on one hand. Now I can count the performers I know who don't do it on one hand. While performers taking up roles, other roles in the sex trade was rare and frowned upon in the early 2000s, by the end of the decade it had become commonplace. Adult performer Houston said in 2013, if you look at the escort sites, pretty much every porn star is on there. So the links between these two seemingly separate forms of sexual exploitation are clear to see when you dig beneath the surface. As we all know, financial pressures, poverty, and in a very best case scenario, the idea of making lots of money are massive driving factors for entering, or more accurately in the majority of cases, being forced into the sex trade, whether this means pornography or prostitution. MindGeek's relentless drive to control and own the porn industry has subsequently left those same women involved exceedingly vulnerable to further exploitation through prostitution. This crash in the uh, late 2000s provided MindGeek with an opportunity to purchase high-profile porn content providers, including big names like Digital Playground uh, at discounted rates, each of which themselves operate dozens of sites. Alongside names like Hustler and Vivid, MindGeek effectively came to control a huge amount of mainstream traditional porn industry, including the Hollywood-like production scene based in California, which was where the uh, household names, for want of a better term, of Jenna Jameson and Sasha Gray made their names. As the Adult Empire Director of Business Development, Colin Allerton, says, Every major studio star is now partnered with MindGeek or has worked for a studio that MindGeek has purchased. Since then, performers have been in the difficult position of seeing their work pirated on sites owned by the same company that pays them. So imagine if Universal Pictures owned the Pirate Bay, for those familiar with Torrance. Performer Tasha Rain told ABC, I kind of have to shoot for MindGeek because they own almost everything. This total industry dominance has had the effect of silencing performers against criticising them. People like performer Siri, who have openly condemned MindGeek's monopoly and power, are extremely rare. When asked, there's a chilling effect on speaking up. Most refuse to talk about piracy, worrying that MindGeek will blacklist them. Since MindGeek-owned companies provide huge amounts of advertising to adult video news and other industry news sites, they wield a great deal of influence over trade publication and events as well. So, with this in mind, it really does make you wonder why, even on a basic legal level, nothing is being done to combat this. To draw a comparison, in 1991, Tetra Pak, who own around 80% of the packaging market, were fined 75 million euros by the EU Commission for abusing their dominant position. So, even if you take the most neoliberal, ruthless approach to the existence of the porn industry and argue that MindGeek are uh, uh, just an example of the free market working perfectly, they are clearly abusing their position by either buying up all the other porn providers or making the market so uncompetitive with piracy that other platforms can't even function. So with that in mind, let's have a look at their monopoly. Now, I've crammed this portfolio development onto one slide for effects. I don't expect you to be able to read it all, and it likely isn't even fully complete. But this just goes to show how all-consuming MindGeek's approach to business is. But here are some of the highlights. So MindGeek, formerly called, uh, very subtly, Manwin, began to really establish dominance in 2010. In 2011, they became operating uh, partner of Playboy, which CEO of Playboy, Scott Flanders, later described as the biggest mistake I've made, stating that Playboy should not have association with being in the sex act business. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that Scott does know what Playboy does, but I think somebody should probably uh, clue him in. 
In 2012, they started to solidify their production portfolio, purchasing Digital Playground. This continued through 2013 to 2015. These slides will be available, by the way, uh, post-conference if you want to dig through it. And looking to the future, in 2018, they started to accept cryptocurrency as a payment method on their sites. Data taken from all the way back in 2014 shows that at least 164 pornographic membership sites were owned or represented by MindGeek. This gives an insight into just how enormous their reach is and how the porn industry really is nothing more than a conveyor belt of bodies being used and abused for profit. Even if, and that's a big even, you buy into the idea of empowerment, this falls flat when you realise the performers you see on all major sites have their profit taken by a global corporation. And on a personal level for me as well, this is what makes the support of the porn industry by those on the political left even more staggering. Often those professing to have progressive or, or socialist ideals in the modern age are the first to argue for sex positivity and empowerment within porn. But I pose this question. What could be more capitalist than the commodification of sexuality for endless consumption by the masses which then results in swelling profits for an unaccountable, unregulated, international corporation shrouded in mystery. The argument simply doesn't stack up. So, moving beyond MindGeek for, for just a moment, although I, I will be returning shortly, no discussion about the functioning of the porn industry in 2019 would be complete without a discussion of age verification. Now, I'll turn to the specifics of the slide behind me shortly, uh, but a brief overview for those of you who aren't familiar. The government have attempted to get to grips with porn's accessibility uh, problems caused by the ubiquity of the internet by introducing age checks across the board. Uh, they've tried to bring in a, a form of age verification, uh, but in what's probably indicative of the capability of the current government it appears I didn't really know how this should look uh, or how it should really work. So now we've been in, lumped with a formally enacted piece of legislation in that it exists in some form, but there is no indication as to how it will actually function or how it can be imposed. So bringing this back to MindGeek, of course they were very interested in how to deal with the concept of age verification. But perhaps surprisingly for some, they saw it not as an obstacle, but like any ruthless corporation, an opportunity to make more money. They were brought into the fold and seen as ethical because they were promoting the image of being concerned about children accessing pornography. Now, this is slightly beyond the scope of this talk, but feel free to talk about it afterwards. Um, it should be noted that MindGeek have spent the past couple of years fighting legal battles in the States to overturn code 2257. Uh, now this is a part of their uh, legal system which regulates record keeping pertaining to the age of performers. So in other words, and they, they recently won this uh, appeal on the grounds of free speech, it being unconstitutional. Now the record keeping of age checks is effectively done on a good faith basis, removing any accountability for secondary producers and above, which, you guessed it, includes MindGeek. So, bringing it back to, to the UK, as they were brought into the talks, MindGeek then started to develop their own age verification software, which, if you think about it, makes perfect sense on a practical level. To draw a comparison, people use PayPal because it's effectively the default option for payment if you don't want to use your card. It's available on most, if not all, websites, so why would you use something else? MindGeek thought the same thing. Why would you use another verification process when you can use one which is already built in to the website you're visiting? A website that just happens to be owned by MindGeek. So presumably, they will manage to retain a large percentage of their consumer base who don't want to give their details over to an untested third-party database. 
But of course, the prospect of handing over personal details to any program, familiar or otherwise, is troubling for, for a lot of people. But fear not, MindGeek have a solution. Alongside their age verification process, they just so happen to be developing a VPN which will allow users to circumnavigate the location-dependent age checks. For those who don't know, a VPN allows users to mask their IP address, effectively hiding or misdirecting us to their location. As they subtly advertise on the VPN's website, unblock every site, access global servers to bypass censorship and restrictions. So the situation we now have is an unregulated corporation who have managed to turn the age verification process not only to their PR advantage by getting into bed with the government, so to speak, but they have also potentially increased their revenue stream by creating VPNs to get around it. What will actually happen remains to be seen, as the age verification process has been consistently kicked down the road. Now, this brings me to the final section of my talk. What do we actually do about this? <coughs> Firstly, MindGeek, of course, needs to be removed from any discussion surrounding age verification. It brings to mind Lucky Strike using doctors to advertise their cigarettes. But we have to think critically about the process of age verification in, in the first place. On a purely administrative level, there are clearly issues with enforceability and implementation of any kind of age verification software. The government has continually delayed the rollout of the age verification process, and the description on the BBFC website is a little bit vague, to say the least, referring to the uh, bold point in the slide behind me. There will be a number of age verification options available, and these are normally provided by third-party companies. So there is no need to share personal information directly with the pornographic website. Age verification solutions range from low-tech options, such as buying a card over the counter in a shop where the verification is face-to-face, -to, -face, to the use of traditional ID documents online. There are digital ID apps, and people can use their mobile phone if the adult filters have been removed. Now, I just want to draw attention to the asterisk, no need to share personal information. Unless, of course, that third party also owns the pornographic website. Under when will the BBFC start regulating, we have, they will announce a date of entry into force. So it's been two years and counting now. The best intentions behind the idea of age verification simply cannot keep up with technology, at least as it stands at the moment. It's reminiscent of a game of whack-a-mole create one barrier to accessing pornography, five other routes pop up. We only need to look at the horror of deepfakes and virtual reality porn to see how technology can be utilised beyond what we thought possible in an effort to create new content. Implementation issues aside, there are other more troubling issues. Age verification isn't a silver bullet whether you support it or not. Clearly, all the problems inherent within the porn industry the abuse, the violence, the misogyny, and the racism that are prevalent in an enormous number of mainstream films would not disappear overnight, or even be fundamentally affected by accessing the content. For this reason alone, we should be at least sceptical or questioning of any kind of temporary legislation. After all, we reject the idea of decriminalisation of prostitution on similar grounds. Implementing a regulatory framework that does nothing to challenge the fundamental problems occurring within prostitution, i.e. the abuse of women, is rejected. Instead, in present company at least, we favour recognising that men should not have a free pass to use women's bodies, especially when we can still support the women involved in prostitution by decriminalising their involvement while trying to stem the tide of the men using them by criminalising them, i.e. the Nordic model. So, to bring about an end to the porn industry, it, depend, it depends on more than simply placing a barrier in between a child and the content and saying you can't watch that. Children are naturally inquisitive, and no doubt when told they can't watch something, would think, well, why not? This is a fair question, and this is, in my opinion, how we bring about the real fundamental change. The horror of the porn industry with its myriad of detrimental effects on the health of consumers, with all its abuse and violence and misogyny and racism on full display. Placing this front and centre is how you get people to turn away. You have honest and frank discussions 
about the fact the porn industry is an industry based on abuse, racism and misogyny, with a PR machine that tells you it isn't. You don't just place a barrier between consumers and the manufacturer, in this case MindGeek. You cut it off at the source and use education to bring people around to the idea of stopping watching pornography altogether. Only then will we see an end to the industry. Thank you.